Welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. This is the October 26th, 2017 edition. And we want to welcome you to our program. And our, our weekly disclaimer, all of our episodes are available on either YouTube or Facebook. Please visit us there to catch up on uh, some of our past episodes in our discussion. Facebook.com slash North Star Oasis, YouTube.com slash North Star Oasis. And it is as simple as that. Before we get into today's content, we do have a special birthday announcement. Yes, it is somebody's 70th birthday today. Happy 70th birthday to Hillary Diane Rodham Clinton. She survived 69 years of life. She is now 70 years old. Um, what do you do for somebody who is now 70? You kind of think that they might be looking at retirement. With Hillary, I'm kind of doubting that, that she's probably uh, figuring she might still have one more campaign left in her. We'll see. Uh, but let's take a look at what she did last year. Because last year's birthday for her, well, actually, before we get into last year's birthday, I want to, uh, I, I looked at her Twitter feed. Um, let's see, I'll just read a couple of tweets that were to Hillary uh, from Bill Clinton. 70 has never looked so beautiful. Happy birthday. Uh, from Chelsea Clinton. Happy birthday, Mom. So thankful for every birthday and every year we've shared. Looking forward to many more. Freedom Works. Today is Hillary Clinton's birthday. If you could say anything to Hillary Clinton, what would it be? Happy birthday or something else? Uh, and then let's uh, move down to O-H-O-U-R, O-Hour. Happy birthday to this future detainee, Hillary Clinton. Heard you got some uranium one for your birthday, and they took a... Um, clip of last year's Hillary Clinton tweet and, and uh, changed it around a little bit to happy birthday to this future inmate. Uh, so I'm giving you the good and the bad. I'm, and then uh, happy birthday, Hillary. Your present will arrive by noon, and that's from uh, Julian Assange. So that's quite the mix, but that's... Uh, Oh, and then uh, somebody named Tony Poznanski had tweeted, I'm not trying to be petty, but I really hope Hillary Clinton gets a birthday cake today with three million candles on it. I don't know what that's supposed to represent. Anyhow, let's see what Hillary did last year for her birthday, because that was quite amazing for her 69th. Well, I got to ask you, did anybody see the last debate? <laughs> well... The good news, the good news was it was the last debate. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that, that last. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, you know, you're right. That, that last debate was like an early birthday present, right? But here's what I wanted you to remember. I stood next to Donald Trump for four and a half hours, proving once again I have the stamina to be president and commander in chief. So now the debate that she was talking about is exactly the same debate that she had written about in her book talking about how uh, she was bullied by Trump and that uh, how he was standing right behind her that's the same same debate that she was talking about so she survived that debate uh, uh, last year and then I'm gonna I'm playing another video this is uh, uh, from a female commentator uh, sitting in her car um, this is what she has to say re last year regarding Hillary Clinton and her uh, and her famous tweet. I 
just wanted to take a moment to wish a special happy 69th birthday to the woman who has really gone above and beyond for other women. To the woman who has broken glass ceilings, here's to you, Hillary Clinton. You reminded us all that it was your birthday today when your campaign posted on Twitter, happy birthday to this future president. And yes, when you say future president, we know that you mean business. You've reminded us that even if you lose in one election cycle, you should always come back in the next one and you should come back with revenge. You did it, Hillary. You were the first woman to become the nominee for the Democratic Party. We as women should be so proud of all that you've accomplished because you've reminded us that it takes a lot in order to get to the spot. You couldn't have done it without all the lies, the cheating, the questionable list of dead bodies that went along with it, and of course running for a party that rigged the primary in your favor. You've been quoted as saying that it takes a village to raise a child, and yet here you are proposing more endless war that would end up bombing both villages and their children. You've taught us that it's okay to be just like all of the men who have succeeded in politics. In fact, if you are, it actually gives you a leg up on the competition. You say that you support equal pay for both men and women, yet the women who work for your Clinton Foundation aren't paid as much as the men. You've reminded us that in order to get this far in politics, you really do have to sacrifice a few things, you know, like morals and ethics. And that's not all you do, Hillary. You are such a champion for women that you accept millions of dollars from places like Saudi Arabia, where they constantly suppress women's rights. You know, you've said a lot of things on the campaign trail about what your presidency would look like. And yes, you've said multiple times that you would do the same things that President Obama did. But the truth is, you're going to go above and beyond that. You're going to make us go to war with Russia, which is something even President Obama hasn't done. And you're proving to the world that it takes a woman in office in order to do that. So happy birthday to you, Hillary Clinton. You are less than two weeks away from possibly becoming the first female president in United States history. And even if that is your title, just remember, you are not the first president who's lied and you're not the first president who's cheated. And yes, people are going to talk about how you're breaking glass ceilings and really setting a standard for women. But just remember, if you're setting a standard, it's a really low one. And it reminds all women that we can and should do better. And there you have it. That was last year's Hillary Clinton birthday and this year's Hillary Clinton birthday. So happy birthday to Hillary Clinton from all of us at North Star Oasis. We seriously, legitimately do mean that. Anyhow, we are going to take a look at today's Prager University segment. Did FDR end the Great Depression? Here is the shocking answer. Did President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal economic policies pull the country out of the Great Depression? My research clearly suggests that the answer, contrary to popular belief, is no. In fact, the New Deal made matters worse. Let me explain. The centerpiece of Roosevelt's New Deal plan to fix the economy was the National Industrial Recovery Act, or NIRA, which the President announced with great fanfare in June of 1933. FDR believed that he could use the government to artificially raise both prices and wages. It would work like this. Higher prices would raise profits. That makes business happy. And higher wages would raise income. That makes workers happy. More profits for business mean more money to hire new workers. Higher wages for workers means more money to buy consumer goods. A virtuous cycle is set in motion, and the economy improves rapidly. But here's what FDR missed. Artificially raising wages also raises labor costs. And when labor costs go up, business hires fewer workers or no workers at all, especially in a difficult economic environment. Meanwhile, artificially raising prices reduces demand for the obvious reason that people buy less of something when its price goes higher. So why did FDR do this? FDR based his New Deal policy largely on what happened during World War I which had ended only 15 years earlier in 1918. During that war, the government established planning boards to set wages and prices, and economic activity increased. If it worked during wartime, FDR reasoned, it should work during peacetime. But Roosevelt confused the increase in economic activity that was actually the result of inflated war demands as being due to government planning. The government, Roosevelt concluded, could much better manage the economy in a time of crisis 
than private enterprise, which in his worldview only considered its own selfish interests. Therefore, government guidance, not free enterprise, was the citizen's steadfast ally. Contrary to what you might think, big business, including autos and steel, were happy to go along with FDR's plan, at least at first. If the government was going to ensure their profits, who were they to complain? So instead of prohibiting monopolies, something the government is actually supposed to do, the NIRA created monopolies on the condition that these favored industries immediately raised wages significantly and bargained collectively with labor. Not surprisingly, the Supreme Court declared the NIRA unconstitutional in May 1935, stating that FDR violated constitutional separation of powers. He had meddled in an area, private business, where he had no constitutional right. But the decision had little practical effect because the government simply ignored it. Meanwhile, the wage side of the equation rose faster than expected because of the passage of another New Deal law, the 1935 Wagner Act. The Wagner Act provided unions with new collective bargaining rights. And as the labor unions grew in size and power, so did workers' wages. The result was that between 1933 and 1939, these government policies, the NIRA and the Wagner Act, increased prices and wages by about 20%. These artificial price and wage increases impeded what should have been a strong recovery from the Depression. They prevented the natural forces of competition from pushing prices down and pushing worker productivity up. Instead, artificially high wages led industry to hire fewer workers, and high prices reduced demand for products. If these policies had not been adopted, my research, as well as research by other economists, indicates the economy would have returned to its normal level of employment and output by 1936. In other words, the policies that were supposed to restore prosperity actually prolonged the Depression. I'm Lee Ohanian, Professor of Economics at UCLA for Prager University. Now, I want to point out that the Weekly Standard uh, magazine just came out with an article in its current edition. It's the October 30th issue, and since the October 30th is coming up in a couple of days, uh, this is the most recent edition. It's called Donald Trump, King of Deregulation. Uh, the government has added an average of 13,000 new restrictions annually for the past 20 years. Under Trump, the number of new regulations is near zero. And then, um, in a, uh, I'll read just the first two paragraphs real quick, and then I get a couple of things I want to skim through. Uh, in a speech on October 11th promoting his tax reform plan, Donald Trump spoke rosily of America's economic revival, crediting himself for having cleared the way for growth. Uh, quote, since January of this year, we have slashed job-killing red tape all across our economy. We have stopped or eliminated more regulations in the last eight months than any president has done during an entire term. It's not even close, the president said. It seemed a characteristic bit of Trumpian uh, magniloquence. He's not only a boffo deregulator, he's the best ever. Still, it was a remarkable claim. Trump has overseen more deregulation than George W. Bush or Ronald. Government is the problem. Reagan? Well, uh, actually, uh, according to jo uh, George Mason University's uh, Patrick McLaughlin of the Mercatus Center, a uh, free market-oriented think tank, uh, who applies innovative research techniques to the study of regulation in the economy. He's looked back, start, really starting with the Jimmy Carter administration moving forward. He has found that there have been periods in some presidencies when regulatory output slowed or declined, but over the full terms of each recent president, including Reagan, regulation increased. But so far, according to McLaughlin, the increase in regulatory restrictions under Trump has been near zero. So Donald Trump is telling the truth. Um, and then one thing here, and this is really, I think, the, the key in understanding why this is so important. And in, if you take a look at the PragerU segment about how this impacted the Great Depression, a 2013 study published in the Journal of Economic Growth found that accumulated regulations between 1949 and 2005 slowed the American economy by an annual average of 2%. 
One of McLaughlin's studies estimates that the cumulative effect of government regulation has caused the economy to be $4 trillion smaller in 2012 than it might have been. And quote uh, from McLaughlin, he wrote that, quote, the amount equaled about a quarter of the U.S. economy in 2012, and if it were a nation's GDP, gross domestic product, it would be the fourth largest in the world. So you see what's happening now with the economy. It's starting to gain some traction. It's starting to get some movement. I'm starting to see more places hiring people. And this is one of the ways of growing, and that is slashing the regulations. And uh, now they're working on the tax bill right now. If you cut taxes, that's going to also jumpstart the economy. Uh, we've covered that in previous episodes of the show. Uh, so if you take a look at what's happening now versus what happened during FDR's administration with the increase in regulation, we got further into the depression under uh, FDR, and we're starting to see economic growth under Trump. Hmm, there's something to that. Um, and by the way, this is something that I have actually studied uh, in-depthly in the past. I will tell you this about the Great Depression. We lost approximately 55% of our GDP in five years, from 1929 to 1934. That's how, how much of a hit we had taken in our, in, to our economy. And that's exactly what was stated there. Every time we seem to increase the national debt, our economy slows. And this goes back to 1791. You know, uh, up until 1960, the prevailing uh, thought from our policymakers was you borrow during times of war and you pay down in times of peace. The last president who actually had successfully reduced the national debt over the previous year was the last year of Dwight D. Eisenhower's administration in 1960. After John F. Kennedy took office in 1961, all the way through present, from both parties, we have never paid down the debt from the previous year. Not one penny. The closest we came was 1999. We were, I still I think it increased by about $27 billion, which is the slowest rate of increase, but it was still an increase. Um, so if we reduce regulations, you reduce taxes, you reduce spending, you balance the budget, we have a thriving economy. That is the recipe. Anyhow, I am going to turn the tables here because the Twin Cities lost a legend uh, on Friday night, and he was a person that I had known uh, quite a uh, had quite a bit of dealings with this man over the last uh, 20 years, um, and that is Stan Crusher Kowalski. He passed away on Friday night. He was very big into, uh, after his um, wrestling career, he was very big into veterans affairs. That's where I had the opportunity of knowing him uh, over the years. Uh, I remember talking to him extensively at the VA. He always called me Sarge. Uh, he could never remember my name, but he always remembered I was an Air Force Tech Sergeant. And that's the only association he had. Last time I saw uh, Stan Kowalski was at uh, the Minnesota History Center on December 7th last year commemorating the 75th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. Uh, Stan was a uh, World War, was in the uh, World War II in the Navy, and so he was there for an afternoon ceremony. He had sp spoken extensively. I was pretty sure I had shot video of his remarks, but unfortunately I have not been able to find it, so we will not be able to play that for you today. But we do have a few other things that we're going to go to. But right now we're going to take a look at a little bit about uh, his life and legacy and an interview with another friend of mine, uh, Pat Turgeon. Oh man, this music always cracks me up. Yeah. All right, let's move on. In the wrestling ring, this guy was known as the Crusher, the Crippler. The Killer. As a VFW leader, he was known as a guy who got things done. Stanley Kowalski is his name. He died Friday at the age of 91. We get more on Stan the Man from John Croman. A veteran is a veteran if they're 20 years old or 85 years old. They still served our country. Stan Kowalski never stopped thinking about the guys he served with in those cramped Navy subs in the Pacific during World War II. He worked tirelessly for that generation of veterans and those who followed. 
he had a love for those fellow servicemen and the crew members that he carried with him a whole lifetime. Pat Turgeon first met Stan when she worked in the legislature and he'd lobby for fellow veterans. Stan Kowalski rarely took no for an answer and I think that's how he got a lot of things done. He did not know fear. Maybe that persona carried over from his days as Crusher Kowalski, one of the monikers he used in his days as a professional wrestler, but he was also fiercely loyal. Once you meet Stan, he's your friend and he will always be your friend. And Here's a clip of Pat and Stan together in Washington at an honor flight event in 2009. His personality was just huge. I first met Stan 17 years ago at Max Bar while working on a story about a lost watch. Oh, well, we can't buy that because of what's on the back of it. You gotta earn that. And when Stan did earn recognition for his own efforts on behalf of veterans, he was kind of tongue-tied. Come home, and this is home. To get something like this, it's above me to be able to speak, and I never thought I'd be at a loss for words. I have seen him call governors and clearly state his opinion on issues. The World War II Memorial at the state capitol was a huge group effort, but Stan was one of the squeaky wheels that made sure it happened. I'm going to miss him, John, just like I miss all my guys. If I think about him, I tear up. I mean, after my cancer battle, there's not much I tear up about anymore. But. I'm going to tear up thinking about Stan. In the next world, he'll no doubt be greeted the way he was on that honor flight, and those left behind will be telling their favorite Stan stories. Stan was always, uh, first thing he always said to me when he saw me was, hello, beautiful, are you going to leave your husband yet for me? And, um, which is, you know, my husband would just, oh. but, uh, so he told me he had to give me a picture of him. So he gave me this picture and it says, to Pat, never forget, Stan Kowalski. And it's a picture of him in his wrestling uniform, but he cut out the other person that was in the picture with him. <laughs> well, he cut it really straight. He did. He did a great job. And I'm thinking this probably isn't the only one that got cut and distributed like this, knowing Stan. But, uh, yeah, that was my buddy. Well, part of the Stan Kowalski legend is that while wrestling for the Gophers after the war, he had a chance to play for the Packers, but decided to go to pro wrestling instead. And when he left the ring in the 1960s, he worked as a police officer, volunteered a lot for the United Way. By the way, his real name, Burt Smith. What? Because Burt Smith, <laughs> as part of Murder Incorporated, you know, Burt Smith, just Stan Smith. Kowalski. Is, is, you know, like he's a killer. Muppet. He's yeah, yeah, Burt Smith just didn't sound like he a wrestler. He chose Stan Kowalski? He's, he's chose Stan Kowalski, yeah. What a renaissance man, though. Yeah, I didn't know no you did all that stuff. Yeah, and I, I've had so many conversations with him over the years, I just wish I had taped all of them, because he, he just, you, you meet him once, you never forget him. He's yeah. a great guy. You know, there's, there are a few people better in this business than the proper story eulogy than you, John Crow, oh. and that was pretty awesome. <laughs> well pretty done, awesome friend. for his family and his friend. That's pretty great stuff. And now we're going to take a look a little bit at his wrestling career. We're going to actually show you part of one of his matches, actually one of his matches. Uh, one of the things <coughs> that he'll, he, he was, it would always tell you is that it was always Crusher with a K. And eventually he became known towards the end of his wrestling career as the Big K. So here is Stan Crusher Kowalski, a.k.a. the Big K, against Larry Reed. We're going to show you his uh, match. This is from the 60s. As I promised, another one fall, 15-minute time limit match. And I assure you, we've had a few little sarcastic words we have ringside between uh, this next man and me. Let's introduce him from Minneapolis, Minnesota, at 270 pounds, six foot four inch, ladies and gentlemen, and a great dynamic wrestler, the Big K. The Big K. His opponent from Colorado Springs, Colorado, weighs in tonight at 231. Let's have a warm welcome for Larry Lee. Larry Lee. Now, don't touch the table. Gee, I, I just say, you got it fixed real nice. No, it's just standing on the oh. leg over here. Well, that was a rugged match. Yes. That was a rugged match. All of Bruiser's matches are rugged. I think we're going to give him no a new name, Mr. Rugged. It makes no difference against whom he wrestles. You know. They're all, they're not the same. That's right. The matches are not the same. That's right. But uh, uh, the outcome is just a holocaust of physical punishment. Chuck, that was very well put. That was very poorly put. I because think that's the only thing I can think of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he is a holocaust. Yes, he is. He's, 
He's just a wild man. You know. uh, is, this is our friend. Uh, this is Larry Reed. Reed, Reed right, right. Reed. I had a long talk with Reed not so long ago. And uh, he's a real eager beaver. And I think that he's going to make it in our business. I hope so, anyway. He's, uh, he's got the determination. And, of course, he's only 27 years old, which is in his favor. And he's been, he's been working out now for a couple of years. Of course, it does take four or five years to really build a star. So I'd say before he celebrates his 28th birthday, he should be on a main event around the country, uh, whether it be here or not. I mean, uh, he certainly has got the uh, looks and the body and uh, his determination, and he's, uh, he's learning fast. There's a lot you have to learn in this business, Chuck, you know, I mean, uh, yes, they, he never wrestled in college, although he did high school wrestling, but uh, he's got to learn the professional catch-as-catch. Catch. Yeah, right. And uh, he's coming along fine. He's a nice boy, very well-mannered, nice, nice gentleman, gentlemanly guy in the, in the like uh, Snyder. So, we are ready for another bruiser. Oh, no. Oh, no. There's a, he is the original I don't care guy. Did I ever tell you that? He is. Oh, yeah. Oh. The I don't care guy. I believe that. Oh, yes. I believe he, I don't care. And if you don't take him that way, then that's all, you know? You either take him like you don't care or... In other words, if, if you care, you don't be around Bruce. Because right. if you that's care, right. you don't want to be around him because he doesn't care. Of course, now we got this big K in here, and he's very impressive. K, of course, since coming back from Japan, coming back from Japan, has been looking real strong. He's still on that fish diet, as you know, raw fish diet. You know, I was uh, I'd, I'd commented about this before, before one of the other programs, uh, wrestling programs that we had. Uh, he, he's not he's not an older man. I mean, he has uh, uh, he looks the right. face. He has he a has pockmarked a... face and uh, well, so does large, Richard Burton, right? Large features. But he's that. ugly. Kay is ugly. And yeah, Richard Burton is handsome. Right. Right. Oh, really? Well, well he is. Well, he's good looking. Right. Yeah, he's I mean, rather good yeah. looking. He's uh, he's. Uh, I think he's handsome. And a woman thinks that he's handsome in some respect, right? My wife I tells me. That. That's, well, that's what my wife well, tells me. I don't know too much about the. But I do know this, that K is ugly. Yep. See, because you can just look him right in the face. Ooh, and he'll scare you half to death. Can yeah. you imagine meeting him somewhere? He's ugly. Yeah. You know, he's ornery and mean. Well, and you can tell that right now. Look at, this, look at these chops. People don't even like him if he tries to let them like him. I remember one, one particular small town, once he went into this town, and he stopped the car in front of the service station. He went in and talked to this attendant. And uh, he wanted to ask him directions. He only attendant just looked at him and didn't like him. I, and I and he said, him. I know who you are. You're the big K. And he says, uh, that's all right. Uh, would you tell me the directions to so and so something telling his wrestling? The fellow says, get out of my, get out of here because I don't like you. And yeah. he says, and big K says, oh, no. He says, I'm not really that mean in the ring. Now, you know what I mean because K was, he needed directions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he says, I'm lost. And the guy says, I will give you the directions if I had a map in my hip pocket and I could give it to him. Because nobody likes this guy. To tell you the truth, I don't like him too well myself. I hear his wife doesn't either. Well, now he's got a beautiful wife. But to see, I can't understand how a woman, a beautiful woman, would go for him. Because, you know, when he's even dressed in civilian clothes, you gotta, you gotta, hey, hey. Yeah, you take him, you say his wife goes, you know, you say, hey, honey, let's go out to the, you know, some exclusive restaurant in town because there's a job there. No, no, <laughs> Kay asked her, and she says, sure, honey, but what's gotta be going out of her mind when she walks in with this ugly guy? Everybody looks up and says, gee, can't you get anything better than that? What an ugly guy. You know what I mean? And she's, all through life, she's got to run around with an ugly guy like that. It's got its problem. Yeah, yeah right. He's, he, that maybe, that's, maybe that's why he's mean. If okay. he's got that problem. <laughs> could be. That could be. Hey, you know, Larry's been doing a pretty good job in there against him. I think so. I tell you. Larry's done. Now, uh, look at this. Look at this thing in here. He applies to that sh shoulder blade. That uh, right. uh, a vice-like grip. Of course, he's got the hammer lock. But uh, see that the fingers. He just he embeds the fingers right in that shoulder. Yeah. Look at that, that face. That has to hurt. This is good. You know, I think he's been cut with a knife on his chin. There. He's got a big scar on his chin, and his hair looks like it's 
It's not for real. It looks like he puts a mop on his head before he goes in the ring. You know, he certainly, now you see, they, they probably draw a cartoon about him, about my business, the wrestling business. Yeah. And say we're in a lousy wrestling business because you got ugly guys like this in the business. What are you going to do? He, he's a top notch wrestler. Ugly, but he. He's, he's, a, he's an ugly top notch wrestler. That's right. Well, what you got to do is find a guy bigger and stronger and just whip him. Like Big Luke would say, whip him. Whip him? Yeah, that's Big Luke. Big Luke says, whip him. him. I think Larry's coming along, really. He's uh, showing a lot better in this match than he has. Uh, I agree with you, even though, I mean, he's, oh, there's that, uh, what is that, is it a backbreaker? Or? A backbreaker or a neckbreaker or something like that, but it, it did the job. Evidently, and again, this uh, very arrogant display of victory uh, by the big K in six minutes and 16 seconds. 616, so the K gets the victory over uh, Larry Reed of Colorado Springs, and we get a moment, just a moment, though, of brief. Sending these boys to do a man's job. We, we get a moment to breathe here, too, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be back with more in just a moment. So that was seeing Stan the Crusher Kowalski in the wrestling ring back in the 1960s. If you kind of notice here, this, you know, this is that transition point between wrestling being wrestling, the way they were wrestling in college, and wrestling starting to really take its early form for what we see now with a lot of the theatrics and all of that. And I remember back when I was growing up, you know, the whole big thing, is this wrestling real or is it fake? And well, it's kind of a mix of both. Uh, but of course, being a teenager then, that was a big deal. Uh, especially when it was, because Kowalski had already retired, so the, you know, th that was before my generation. You know, we had uh, Jesse, the, uh, Jesse the Body Ventura, um, Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, th those are the guys, Junkyard Dog, those are the guys of my generation of wrestlers. And even those guys have now pretty much faded off into the sunset. And one I know became a governor. Um, but notwithstanding, I mean, what we're seeing now is kind of that third generation, maybe even a fourth generation of wrestling uh, under, under Vince McMahon. Prior to that, of course, we had the WWE, WWF. We had the NWO for a while. But then before that, we had the AWA with Stan Kowalski. And before that was pretty much college wrestling. So that's kind of the migration of, of wrestling. And now we are actually going to show you a uh, video that was done on a Minneapolis uh, public access uh, station. And actually, we're just going to run both of these together because it's part one and part two. Uh, so we're going to have uh, an interview from 1997 with Stan Crusher Kowalski. Uh, and he, he, he actually discussed more than just wrestling. He actually talked about uh, some of his political life along with uh, getting into the veterans community, school children. And I, I really find that this is a very informative interview. But this was, of course, you're seeing you know, on that video how he looked when he was younger. Now we're going to take a look at how he looked 20 years ago because you can actually see kind of the progression uh, you know, of, of his aging you know, throughout the years. Let's take a look at the part one and part two from the 1997 interview. Hey. Hello. Officer. Here we are back. back on the Primadons, live and in person. And the Primadons come through, as always, with guess who's sitting next to us, living legend, famous professional wrestler, promoter, political activist. Here he is. The one and only. Crusher. Crusher. Kowalski. The original Stan Crusher. Crusher. Kowalski. Crusher with a K. With a K. Crusher with a K. Now with a C. Original Crusher. That's right, Joe. The real Crusher. That's right. That's yeah, so right. I'm working a little bit with wrestling right now, and I heard you talking about the show that Eddie Sharkey's going to have on Channel 2, and I'd suggest you people Take a good look at it. Sharkey's a pretty decent promoter, and he's trained a lot of good men. I think it'd be worthwhile to watch. So we might get a real inside look at what it takes I to uh, I would under I would think so. Because, you know, you got this uh, young Kraft fella, and he showed me a lot of guts when he tried me one night. And so I respect him, too. And some of the other guys that Eddie Sharkey has put out into professional wrestling are big names in stardom today. And... Uh, Eddie promotes around the area, and 
I've been doing a little bit too, but most of the shows that I promote, in fact all of them, have to be fundraisers. And they have to be for groups that are nonprofit, like the schools, like the VFWs, the Legions, the Lions Clubs. My Lions Club at Spring Lake Park is exceptionally community orientated and the same thing goes for, I'm the incoming commander for the Fridley VFW in June, I hope, if I get elected. And they really are community orientated. You people out there that are veterans, if you don't belong to the Legion of the VFW, you're not fulfilling the obligation, let me tell you that. But I'll tell you, what do you, you guys said you want to talk wrestling. Let's talk wrestling. Okay, All let's right. get, I know uh, you've been just as active after you stopped wrestling, obviously, as when you were wrestling. So we're going to save some time to get back to some of those, uh, some of the political issues that, you, uh, that you're involved with right now. But yes, yes, we're obviously diehard wrestling fans. We've loved it all our lives, and it's such a thrill to have a, a legend like yourself live in person on right the here. prima dons and yeah we've got some wrestling uh questions you sure. want to lead us on Tom? go ahead shoot. we're curious how you got started in professional wrestling how did that come about uh it was kind of an odd situation i was wrestling i was actually boxing in high school okay. at minneapolis north it was the only high school would take me <laughs> <laughs> and uh they had an opening on the wrestling squad for a heavyweight and i only weighed about 180 pounds i really wasn't too big I said, that sounds like fun. So I gave it a try and uh, went from there and uh, wrestled in the Navy. I came out and I went to the University of Minnesota. When I came out of the University of Minnesota, 1950, I turned pro almost right away. I had a little stint trying to play fo pro football, but when you make $7,000 for a year, and I'm talking way back before a lot of you people out there were born, uh, single wing stuff, uh, one team plays both ways. Didn't have these prima donnas just come in to stop a pass and then run That's out right. and they get $10 million. What a waste of money to pay a professional athlete a million dollars, much less 10. I don't know of any athlete out there, and I know a lot of good ones. Not a one of them worth a million dollars a year. And you know where that money comes yeah, from, people? It here. It comes right out of your pockets because the tickets go up and up and up. The only one really that I still say the ticket is, is fairly well placed is the Minnesota Twins. And I love the Twins. I get to every game I can. And I go to all six Gopher football games because there's nothing better than the University of Minnesota athletic uh, programs out there. Both men's and women's. Our women in basketball are moving along. Our wrestling team, one of the best in the country. Our football six, team will be ranked. good this year. And let me tell you, and this is not wrestling, but I'm, uh, I'm onto this one little thing. Jim Wacker was a good coach. He didn't have the great horses that you need to compete in the Big Ten, but he was doing well. He did three. We did four wins this year. Mm -hmm. He would have had five. You see what Mason does next year. If he gets five or six, unless there's some true freshmen playing that he drafted, you've got to give Wacker credit for it. But I'll tell you something else. This, this Mason fella is really a go-getter. He's already got four or five of the blue chip guys. Didn't know where they were going. And he will take this team to a bowl probably next year, if not the next year after that for sure. You people that don't have season tickets, you better go get them now because they're going to be at a premium. And they're not very expensive. You can go to a whole season for about $105. Where are you going to get that kind of entertainment? The Gophers, that's it. The and Twins. The twins. No, hey, Gophers everybody is now becoming a fan of the, of the Whoopies. All of a sudden, you win a few games, you become a fan, right? Fair weather, they jump on the way. Jump right on the bandwagon. But I love these Minnesota people. I've been here, I was born and raised here, came back here when I could have gone any place in the world. And this is my home. My family lives here. My lovely wife, 35 years. My two kids. It's a great city, great place to raise your kids, believe me. And she's trying to tell us we got 15 minutes left, so let's talk All wrestling. Right. Let's talk, what should we right talk about? I'm, I'm already enthralled. You can talk about gopher sports or anything you want. Did, were you formally trained? Did somebody take you under their wing and say, here's how you're going to make it in professional yeah. wrestling? My first or? trainer was a guy named Joe Pazendak. If you remember him, they used to call him the Prince champ. Bell. Joe the champ, Pazendak, University of Minnesota graduate. Tough guy. No neck. His head fit right on his shoulders. You couldn't put a headlock on him if you wanted to. Then after that, I went out to California and Sandor Zabo, another world champion, trained me. But he trained me to 
He said, you got to obey the rules. Well, if a guy's kicking me in the face, the rule says I kick you back. Believe me, That's I'm not going to stand there and let you do something to me that I can't do back. And that, you heard it here. My golden rule was do it to them before they do it to you. That's the way to win. Yeah. But the idea is not win if you lose. Win if you can, lose if you must. But always make sure you're on top at the end. Yeah. And you know, everything in life's that way. You kids in school, you think you got it pretty tough and all that? You don't know what tough is yet. But if you don't go through school, you're going to have it so tough you won't be able to exist out here. Get in that school. I spent 18 years as a school board member of Spring Lake Park. I read about what the governor and the legislature says about the schools falling behind. Why don't you drop out to Spring Lake Park or Fridley or Blaine or Anoka or Coon Rapids and find out what's going on in the school? Some of you people in the legislature, you haven't been out in the school in 20 years. How do you know what's going on out there? Well tell said, Stan. Tell them. Boy, well I tell, said. I'm on a soapbox, Bravo. but I really get Bravo. Bravo. Right ahead. This is your forum. Right yes, here. Let me tell you something. Night. They're talking about raising the legislature. They're in there for four months. They're getting more money than most of us make in a, in a year's salary. You don't need that kind of money. You're supposed to be volunteers helping our state. Exactly. To just get a look at the list of the people they got going for regent at the University of Minnesota. What do they got there? They got a doc. They got doctors. They got lawyers. They got ministers. They got superintendent of schools. What happened to the people that live in the houses? Nobody out there is a common person. They're all up in the upper echelon. How do you know what it takes for us to make money to get our kid into school? That's right. They just they don't, don't. They don't understand. <clears throat> now I wasted five more minutes. You can <laughs> waste all, all the time That's you want. Who am I to tell Professor <laughs> Kowalski that he can't exactly? Yeah, it's your forum. Let me you tell you whatever something. you want. Right. Let me just put this in too. All right. Sixty-six hundred professional wrestling matches. I wouldn't trade any of them for any other profession out there. How I was the greatest? 6,600. And the toughest guy, well, I could put about five of the toughest guys I ever wrestled in my life. Louis says, world champion, great man, class act, one of the best you would ever see in a ring. Right with him, right alongside of him, a guy that I had many battles with, and up until lately, I couldn't call my friend, but now he is a friend, Vern Gagne, probably one of the best that ever got a ring in the common Absolutely. wrestling of today. Absolutely. Another one that comes out of this area, another class act, Nick Bockwinkle, fantastic wrestler, great gentleman. He is welcome in my house anytime he wants. Bruno San Martino, another one that I kicked up the East Coast with. And I had a lot of fun doing it. Wrestling was great to me. And I'm trying to pay back now because that's why I work in my community and all over the state trying to help kids and trying to help schools. 18 years I was in, a, in the school boards. And in 1992, they selected me the Outstanding State School Board Member of the Year for the state. Great honor. Lions Club, I just got uh, Lion of the Year, another great honor. I've got the Melvin Jones Award, biggest you can get from the international. Let me hey, it's hey. a play! Hey, everybody's favorite I have to put it this way. I drink Coke, I also drink Pepsi. <laughs> <laughs> because I, uh, the last five years I've been speaking for United Way and I do anywhere from 250 to 300 speeches from, uh, from September to November. <laughs> Both these companies are great backers of United Way. Coca-Cola sponsored the Olympic run, you know. They elected, they selected 35 people. That's right, I was people. going to ask you about your Olympic yeah. emblem on your lapel. They selected there. 35 people to be what they call community heroes. I was one of the 35 in the state they selected. <laughs> I carried the Olympic torch June 1st. Right. But what That's I up, did, Moro. I Thank represented you, the people of the state of Minnesota. And that was from 1997 on um, the Primadons program in Minneapolis. And uh, that was Stan Crusher Kowalski, who had passed away at age 91 last Friday night. Uh, of course, he had received a lot of recognition and honors in, most re you know, in more, more recent years for his uh, ex distinguished career. And we're going to take a look. At, this isn't necessarily specific about him, but he is one of the ones who were mentioned. This came out last year on uh, the Wrestling Hall of Fame in Robbinsdale. 
Well, this Saturday is a big day for three local wrestling legends. Well, that's right. John Gregelko, Stan Kowalski, and Alan Rice will be inducted into the Minnesota Wrestling Hall of Fame on Saturday. The Hall of Fame is located in Robbinsdale, and 12 News spoke with Alan Rice about the honor. Rice is a former U of M wrestler who completed in, er, competed rather in the 1956 Olympics and also coached the U.S. Olympic team in 1972. He believes wrestling teaches many life lessons. Well, I think wrestling teaches our people determination, teaches, uh, teaches people to get up off the mat when they've been down, and that's an important part of our political and historical background, I think. Determination, and I think the main thing is shows that the hard work pays off. Rice is from St. Paul, but comes to Robbinsdale often and calls the city a wrestling hub. The first so Stan Kowalski and uh, and Rice, they they were uh, inducted into the uh, Hall of Fame. Uh, I actually had seen one video for uh, Crusher Kowalski's Hall of Fame um, induction. The problem is, it was a ten minute introduction, but you didn't see him. You just heard all these glowing things about him, and it would have been nice to have actually heard him discuss how he felt about receiving that Hall of Fame honor. But he did also uh, sit down last year for a interview uh, to discuss his Hall of Fame uh, and awards and honors that he had had during his career. And so we're going to take a look at that right now. Each other, the first responders, the police officers, the firefighters, the paramedics, people helping people. These are our everyday heroes. Well, this Saturday. Okay, well, it looks like we are not going to uh, get to that um, right away. Um, so bear with me for just a moment. Um, you know, he used to come out to our base quite a bit, and um, that's the one. So anyhow, uh, Stan Kowalski used to come out to our base, the 934th Airlift Wing Air Force Reserve. He used to do a lot of uh, work for our deployment ceremonies. He would um, you know, spend time with our troops. He was always a, always a gentleman, but he also had that celebrity swagger. Uh, I saw him numerous times when I was working at the VA. He would stop in, sometimes as a patient, sometimes just to visit. And no matter where you went, Stan Kowalski always had a had a crowd and he always had a way of mesmerizing you into his little sphere of influence and he, he was real genuine genuine uh, sweetheart uh, of a man do we have the uh, video okay it looks like we are ready to go with his uh, interview looking back at his Hall of Fame career Stan Kowalski from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and you won two awards tonight. First, you want to just tell us the uh, awards that you won? One is uh, this one here is a Merit Lifetime Service Award for things I've done outside of the ring. And this one here is the Patriots Award because I have, my main life is dedicated to helping veterans. And you were telling me uh, you were one of the first people in the AWA when it started. Yeah, Tiny Mills and I were the first two to come in for Ganya. We were both from Minneapolis, so that helped too because it got us home. And Did you uh, know Ganya? Yeah, I went to college with Vern at Minnesota. I was his alternate there on the team. I couldn't beat him. And I beat him once in 1961 in Minneapolis for the bill and they didn't talk to me for a year and a half. <laughs> well, that's the way it is. That was the AWA title? That was the AWA title, yeah. The AWA title? Yeah, I had 19 major titles. I uh, can't remember them. From coast to coast, I wrestled all over the world. I was the Australian champion. And I was a champion in Japan. So AWA would have been your favorite territory? Oh, yeah, because I was born and raised in Minneapolis. And, it, when Ganya had it, even when Ganya had it, I was making more money here than they were any place else. Yeah, I left here and I wrestled New York and California, you name it. 
the best, two best places I like wrestling were Australia and Japan, though. You don't speak Japanese. Of course not. Yeah. <laughs> I, I brought a bunch of the Japanese wrestlers over here one at a time, and I kind of managed them and tag teamed with them. And it endeared me to the people over there. So when I went over there, I couldn't wrestle my regular style because I was a hero. <laughs> Did you ever wrestle Mad Dog Deshaun? No, Deshaun and I were good friends. And he, let me tell you something, he was a little bit small, but as, as tough as he looked in the ring, he was tougher. A lot of people don't know that the Mad Dog was an amateur champion before he became a pro, and he was tough, and he had lots of guts. I still respect him. Did you ever see him in action in one of his uh, notorious bar fights? Never in a bar fight, no. I got in a few, though. Yeah. <laughs> I got in one in Minneapolis that was pretty bad. Took about 10 cops to get me out of there. <laughs> Did you uh, ever wrestle Andre the Giant when he came? Through? I was the first one to wrestle him. They brought him. When they brought him into New York, they called me up. I was here. They called me and said, would you like to make X number of dollars? I said, yeah, and it was a real big guarantee. He said, you got to wrestle Andre the Giant. I said, who's that? I never heard of him. He said, the guy we're bringing from France over here. And he's a pretty good wrestler, but he's got to get known. And I, we figure if we give him a name like you to wrestle, that'll get him up a little bit. So I said, sure, and I got a heck of a piece of change. So that was the very first match he had in America. Very first match he had in the, in the United States. Oh, wow. And You're pretty your good size, too, though. <laughs> Not quite a giant, though. No. What, well, you could make yourself a giant in the people's eyes. Definitely. What's uh, your favorite memory of the professional wrestling business? Beating Vern Gagne in 1961 in Minneapolis. That was the highlight of my life. You know, it's my hometown and his, and we were friendly uh, people fighting each other at the U. We worked out with each other because we were the same weight. And Vern was really a super good guy when you got to know him at first. After a while, he kind of changed. I, I don't know if you have to change because you're a promoter or what, but his attitude wasn't the same that I was liking. So we just kind of split our ways. And is there uh, anything you want to say to any of your fans that might watch this and see it? Well, I'm Stan Crusher Kowalski, the big K, and uh, I've enjoyed wrestling in Minnesota and the area here for over 25 years. And I appreciate the support you're giving these young fellas coming up because they're doing a job for you to watch, and they're all actually better athletes than we were. You can tell just by looking at the bodies on them. So anyway, when you see a pro wrestling match, don't hesitate. It's cheap entertainment, but it's great entertainment, and it's a great knife to go out to. That's very true. Thank you very much. Crusher Kowalski gave a speech uh, highlighting the role that his service in the U.S. Navy had played on him in his career and on 9-11. And we're going to go right to his 9-11 speech. Each other, the first responders, the police officers, the firefighters, the paramedics, people helping people. These are our everyday heroes. They did their job, they lost their lives also. I felt that they needed to be honored then, today, tomorrow. We go along our days doing what we do. We need to remember not all heroes wear a cape. They wear a uniform, a badge. They have no idea what the day will bring to them and they have no idea what could happen. For that they will be honored today, tomorrow, and always. We thank our military for serving and protecting us. We pray for their safety and their return home. We should thank our everyday heroes also. Let them know that we pray for their safety as well. All lives matter every day. God bless you all. 
God bless the USA, and thank you all for listening to an old World War II fan. And again, Stan Crusher Kowalski passed away last Friday at age 91. He will actually be uh, buried tomorrow, or his, his funeral is tomorrow. Um, so that was kind of a life in retrospect. He was a great man. He will definitely be missed by those of us who were fortunate enough to have been graced by his presence uh, in, you know, in, in this lifetime. Uh, whether it was in his time in the wrestling ring, whether you would stop for coffee at the VA, whether you would see him on uh, trying to uh, promote a veterans memorial or working on the school board, stopping by cable access station to you know, discuss his Hall of Fame wrestling career. He touched the lives of many and that is why I have, uh, or we as a staff have determined that today is kind of Stan Crusher Kowalski Day here on North Star Oasis. And I guess uh, back in the 1980s in wrestling, they had a lot of, uh, that's really when you started getting the themes. And so we're going to exit with a theme from Hulk Hogan, but this song fits Stan Crusher Kowalski just as much as it does Hulk Hogan. 